Let me real quickly give you just an overview of, of I mentioned Ukraine and other nations say, you guys in America had it right for a long time. Come show us how you did it. Not how you're doing it now, but how you did it then. And, and I know we've got folks here, about 7 or 8% is from other nations. But let me, let me just do something particularly for Americans because we're so stinking blessed. We don't realize how blessed we are and we take a lot of things for granted. Um, but when you take and, and look at where we are as a people and you look at our documents, we've been under these particular documents. It's coming up. We got it, guys. Slides back up. Whoops, we lost it. There it is. We've been under these particular documents for a long time. It's the only government we've ever had. Uh, this year at the United Nations, there's 195 nations. Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. It was that way when he left. It'll be that way till he gets back. That's the normal condition of mankind. The fact that America has only had one revolution, one government in that period of time, unbelievable. You look at us and you, you take these other 195 nations, we've had one constitution since 1789, that's it. Just watch the other nations. You can take any continent you want to, you can take any country you want to, and look at the turmoil and turnover that goes within those countries. And I mean, now we're into the, we're into the 20th century and look at all the numbers, this is in the 20th century. Um, as a matter of fact, if you're a baby boomer from South Korea, you've had six constitutions in your lifetime. You know, six in your lifetime? If you're 95 years old and you live in Poland, you live through seven revolutions and seven constitutions. Across the world, people tend to experience a revolution or a constitution every generation or so. Not us. We've had one. And we take that stability for granted. We just think stability is natural because we have it. Stability is not natural. In the same way, we have a creativity that's unlike any place in the world. You see, we in America are only 4% of the world's population, but every year we produce more patents, more technology, more discoveries, more medical cures, more symphonies, more everything than the other 96% of the world combined. Now, 4% of the world's population should produce 4% of the world's whatever. Our 4% produces more than the 96%, and the same with our prosperity. Our prosperity is such that our 4% of the world's population produces 25% of the world's gross domestic product. And it's not because we have greater natural resources. We don't. There are many nations who have greater natural resources than we do by a long shot. We just take what we have and make it more productive than any other country. So that's, that's something that, that's known as American exceptionalism. And, and we, are, we are so prosperous. And, and by the way, this is a term that was given us by a Frenchman in 1831 who came to America, traveled here, said, I can't believe this. He said, I don't think any country will be able to do what America's done. Because see, he, he was in France. He was involved in the judicial system of France. He was a, a public official there in France. And they were having trouble with crime in France. As a matter of fact, they used the guillotine to execute more than 40,000 individuals in France. And so they're looking over to America and saying, America's not having that trouble. I, this is, see what's happening there. And so he got here. And by the way, I showed you founding father uh, James Kenn a minute ago, the father of jurisprudence who came up with the, the circuit court system. He was in charge of the entire judicial system in the state of New York. And in the period of time, and he served in addition on the Supreme Court of New York for 16 years. He's in charge of all the courts in New York. He himself is on the Supreme Court for 16 years. And he was absolutely appalled at the crime wave that was sweeping New York in the time that he was on the court. Because in those 16 years he was on the court, they had eight murders in New York. Wow. Eight murders in 16 years. A murder every other year is a crime wave? It was in America. Well, you can understand why other nations came and said, what are you guys doing? And uh, as de Tocqueville went back, he's the guy who gave us the term American Socialist. He went back and said, religion is involved in everything there. They've got societies for prisoners and societies for prostitutes and societies for sailors and societies for nurses. They've got societies for, and it's all done by the churches. The churches are doing all, he said, I've never seen this. He said, in France, I'm used to religion and government marching in opposite directions. He said, in America, I found them intimately joined together. He said, religion is the greatest of their political institutions. You know, and that's a, a guy from France who's never seen this before. Now, having, having said all that, in textbooks, if we say, well, America is different from other nations, we will invariably say, well, who's responsible for us being different from other nations? And what we will invariably do is we'll say, well, there's great political leaders like George Washington, you got Thomas Jefferson, and, and, and you've got folks like uh, John Hancock, and, and you got John Adams, and you know, we go through all, and that's great, these are great political leaders, and they had a whole lot to do with America being a, a free independent nation. But it's interesting that that's the names we use today, but you ask these guys back then who's responsible 
for all these blessings we have in America, they give you totally different names. A great example, 1818, 42 years after the American Revolution, John Adams is an old man. He signed the Declaration of Independence, our birth certificate, 1776. 1818, a young historian, Hezekiah Niles, comes to him and says, Adams, I mean, we're enjoying all these blessings in America, but we didn't see what was the cause of it all. Um, you were there. You're an eyewitness. I mean, you saw this. Who's responsible for all this stuff we enjoy today? And so Adam started giving names. He starts saying, well, if you want to know who's responsible for all this we enjoy, he said, you've got to start with Reverend Dr. Samuel Cooper. And of course, there's the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew. J Mayhew is the guy, by the way, who preached the, the sermon on earthquakes, the five-week sermon. He says, you got Mayhew, and of course, uh, there's George Whipple. And don't, don't forget the Reverend Charles Chauncey. And he starts going through all these preachers. Now, that's not who we get in our textbooks today. We're not told that preachers are the ones who created America. We're told it's all the political guys who did America. And by the way, it doesn't matter whether the preachers were white or black. We don't talk about them. Because back in the founding era, you had preachers like Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, and you had John Morant, and you had Lemuel Haynes. And we never hear about any of these guys. Preachers, black and white, they're the ones who shaped America. As a matter of fact, just to give you an example of what we don't talk about that would be fun, this preacher right here is Harry Hoosier. Harry Hoosier was an evangelist, a revivalist in the First Great Awakening. He's there with, with the Wesley brothers and with Asbury and with Bishop Francis Asbury and with Richard Koch, and he's there with Whitfield and all the others. And he actually had larger crowds. Benjamin Rush, the guy I talked about earlier that did all the, the, the education stuff, Benjamin Rush said he's the greatest orator I've ever heard. My gosh, Benjamin Rush has heard Patrick Henry and he's heard George Washington. He says, no, no, this is the greatest orator I've ever heard. But you see, Harry Hoosier didn't want to preach where everybody else was preaching. He went out to the wildest, hairiest areas of America that he could get to, where all the wild guys were. That's where he wanted to preach the gospel, where, where the toughest nuts were to crack. And that's where he went. And, and by the way, anybody recognize the word Hoosier? Does that seem familiar to anybody? <laughs> see, the really wild guys, the furthest west you could go at that time was Indiana. So that's where all the wild guys are, is out in Indiana. So he preaches all these revivals across Indiana, and as, the li as, as their lives are changing, the people are becoming different, and they're putting into practice all these things, their friends would look at them and say, what happened to him? Oh, he's one of those Hoosier guys. I wonder how many guys in Indiana know that they were named after a black evangelist. Probably <laughs> none. No? It, it's... The impact of the church and preachers on every aspect of life is easily documented. And so John Adams, and, and why in the world would John Adams point to all these preachers and say, these are the guys responsible? And it's really simple. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, our birth certificate, that's our political charter, it starts with 126 words that set forth five principles of American government, the philosophy of American government, five principles. It's then followed by 27 grievances showing how those principles have been, been violated by Great Britain while we were separating, and then it concludes. And you look at the Declaration of Independence, you look at every right listed in the Declaration of Independence, and historians have documented that every one of those rights had been preached from the American pulpit prior to 1763. Now, you know what that means? That means the Declaration of Independence was nothing more than a listing of the sermons we've been here to church for the last 20 years. Try reading the Declaration of Independence as a list of sermons, because that's what it was. All the rights in the Declaration had been preached from the American pulpit. You see, the Bible applied to every aspect of life. That was, that was the basis of who we became as a nation. That's why preachers are responsible for who we were. And that's also where the term the Black Regiment came from. Because preachers back then, black and white, all wore those black clerical robes. And the British are the ones who gave the American preachers that title. They said, it's, it's that black regiment. They said, if it wasn't for those preachers, America would still be a happy British colony. And so they blamed the preachers for what went on, which is why when the British arrived in America, they specifically singled out preachers for targeting. For example, when they landed in New York City in 1777, there were 19 churches in town. They probably went through the city and burned or desecrated every one of those 19 churches. They went across Virginia burning churches, across Maine, New Jersey burning churches. And when they caught a preacher and put him in a prisoner of war camp, you can say goodbye to him because you won't see him again. I mean, it was the British blamed the preacher for what was going on. Now, we never get that in American history today, but that's where the title came from at that point in time. So the, the, the clergy showed remarkable leadership back then. I've showed you sermons like this. 
this election sermon, the reason, this is the longest traditional form of sermon in America. It's called an annual sermon. An annual sermon is a sermon so important that you preach about it once every year. Every year, our churches are going to have Christmas sermons. We're going to have Easter sermons. We're going to have Thanksgiving sermons. And we should, because those are important things. We do them every year. That's why the Bible itself set up six holidays. It said, you Jewish people, you will come before me six times a year so you can remember what I've done for you. And so it started off with three holidays, and they added others as it went along. And so God first had three days He wants everybody appearing before Him. And He says, your kids are going to ask you why you're doing this, and you tell them why we're doing this day. And so it was the way we transmitted to subsequent generations the story of what God had done on those days and why those, and those were holidays or holy days. They were, they were important. That's why we set them aside. So w election sermons were also an annual sermon. We did them once every year. And the reason was we know out of First Timothy, we know out of Romans, we know out of Titus, we know out of so many passages, out of Jude, that government is an institution ordained by God. It is God ordained. That's why that book I showed you, 1500 Bible verses, God speaks about it very explicitly. So when these folks got to America, they, they landed in America, and as they established government, because God wants government, they established self governing nations. It starts in, in 1619 with the first elections in America. And as we started having elections and we're in America, and they say, all right, God established government. What type of government did he establish? Well, he established here a, a government where we elect our leaders. And again, I told you the Bible verses they use for electing leaders. And so since that's a God-ordained institution and we're doing what God said about choosing leaders, starting in 1633, they had what were called election sermons. And those election sermons, once every year, talked about, all right, here's what the Bible, it's election time. Here's what the Bible says about the type of leaders you should choose, about what you look for in your leaders, about who should be in office, who should not be in office. And it just went, and so every, not every election, but every single year, we had an election sermon in the American church, which is why participation was always so high. Today, uh, since 1980, if, if you don't like the way the federal government's operating right now, you're not, you're, you're not in the minority, you're in the majority. Since 1980, only one out of six Americans have been responsible for choosing the President of the United States. Five out of six have said, I'm not getting involved in that. Well, that's why everybody complains, because five out of six won't do anything with it. You know, you go to Second Kings and say, why sit we here till we die? Let's get up and do something. Well, if people voted, if half of Christians voted, we wouldn't have any culture war in America. The whole thing would be over with. But we're voting about 25% of Christians typically, and that's really low. So back then, you had 100% voter participation because God expected it of you. You're going to stand before Him someday. He's going to say, I gave you your life, what'd you do with it? We'll answer. I gave you your family, what'd you do with that? We'll have to account. I gave you your possessions, what'd you do with that? We'll have to tell Him. I gave you your country and your vote, what'd you do with that? Oh, decided not to get involved in that one. Wrong answer. That's Matthew 25, Luke 19. The servant who had been given a trust and refused to use it is the guy who got in trouble with the master. He gave us a vote. He gave us a government. He said, you guys take care of it until I get back. Luke 19, 13, he said, you occupy till I come. He says in Matthew 12, blessed are those that when I return, I find so doing. We're supposed to be busy doing it. We're not. And so that's why we had those sermons back then. We don't have those sermons now, but that was part of, of what shaped America at the beginning. So election sermons, I chose this sermon specifically because of the names involved. This is a sermon preached before His Excellency John Hancock, signer of the Declaration, Governor of Massachusetts, first governor, His Honor Sam Adams, signer of the Declaration, father of the American Revolution, Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, and is a sermon preached in front of the Council, Senate, and House of Representatives of Massachusetts. For 170 years, we started state legislative sessions by having a minister come in and talk to the entire state government. That's what we did normally. Here, here's an, another sermon. This is preached before Samuel Huntington. He's a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He's a general and is preached in front of the General Assembly of Connecticut. All their legislators are there. Here's a sermon, Oliver Wolcott. He himself, uh, Oliver Wolcott, is a signer of the Declaration. And it's a sermon in front of the General Assembly of Connecticut. I mean, this is typical, 170 years. We always had the church shaping public policy and what went on because we knew the Bible. And if you do the biblical thing, it's going to work really well. I mean, it's just real simple. And that's why we were involved in those. Here's a voice of warning to Christians on the ensuing election of a president of the United States. You see, what we did is, oh, it's a presidential election. You got two candidates running, one's from this party, one's from that party. This guy says that, that guy says that. All right, taking the issues they're talking about, here's what the Bible says about these issues. And based on what the Bible says about these issues, there's no way a Christian can vote for that guy. You're going to have to vote for that guy because he's the only one that's close to what the Bible says. Wow. You ever heard a sermon like that in church today? Don't think so. Everybody's worried about their 501c3 tax exemption. But for 350 years in America, these are the sermons we had. Now, why would we do that? Because the Bible is filled with that. Do you remember 
Elijah was about to confront Ahab and Jezebel, the national leaders, and he was about to tell them, he said, we have not had rain in this nation for three and a half years because of your wicked policies. What you did with eminent domain, you took the property away from Naboth, you took his vineyard, you perverted justice in the courts, you brought in false witnesses to perjure themselves before him, and he went through all the public policies. Because of your public policies that are so wicked, he's getting ready to call them out. And fortunately, he remembered his 501c3 tax exempts and kept his mouth shut. <laughs> It's not what Elijah did. You know, Nathan and Gad, they're just about to confront David over his adultery with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah. They're about to say, David, thou art the man. And fortunately, they remembered their 501c3 tax exemption. See, it used to be that throughout the Bible, it was the church that confronted the civil arena and said, here's the plumb bob of righteousness, and you guys aren't lining up with it. We don't do that today. We can't talk about candidates. What are we thinking? We did for 350 years. We had, we had sermons like this. So why would we preach those kind of sermons? Look at this Bible verse, Malachi 2.9. Malachi 2.9 says, The priest's lips should keep knowledge, and the people should seek the law at his mouth. We didn't go to attorneys to get advice on law. We went to preachers to get advice on law because they could take every law and line it up with the Bible and say, no, 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 that's, that's not a good law. This. So we sought the law at the mouth of the preachers, for he's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. I mentioned earlier, when God got his people out there in the desert, he said, all right, let's build a nation now. He gave them 613 laws. It deals with every arena of life. It deals with military. It deals with immigration. It deals with education. It deals with taxation. It deals with property. It, it's all there. It, it, and so that's why we went to the preachers. That they were very involved in this arena. What's happened is we've compartmentalized our faith. The Supreme Court has told us our faith is important, but you need to keep it over in certain areas. You, you, you keep it over here, but of course education is over here. Now your faith is really good, but we don't need to sit in law or government or politics and separation of church. And your faith is really good, but keep it out of health care and don't get your faith involved in economic stuff because that's all sec secular stuff. And so what happens now is Christians think that there's a difference between the secular and the spiritual, and there is not. I guarantee you God judges every aspect of life by His Word. You're not going to see, we saw that picture of the final judgment on Michelangelo, you know, they're coming before and all the words and all the thoughts and all the deeds are there and people are being judged and we see it all, the, the Lamb's book of life and it's open, the book of works and revelation, those two books are open and they're going through all of it and we're watching and here comes a guy and God says, whoa, time out, that guy was involved in politics, my word doesn't apply to politics, he's off the hook, not going to happen. God judges every aspect of life by His standards. There is no difference between the secular and the spiritual. It is, all is to be judged by God's Word. So Christians today have made this distinction, and that's what I was talking about in Ukraine. Our missionaries have told people, government is bad, stay out of government. They're all corrupt over there. Well, the reason they're corrupt is because you stayed out of it. If, you, I mean, if Christians get out of the church, it'll be corrupt too. Anything Christians get out of, we're the salt and light and preservative. If you take the preservative out, it will rot. Guess what? So why are you surprised that government's corrupt if all the Christians got out of it? Yeah, see, that's the, that's the illogic of what we've done. We compartmentalized our faith, and we divided the secular from the spiritual, and you can't do that. So, and, and by the way, you know, going, going back to this, I love the passage in Romans 12, verse 2. In the King James, it says, Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But I love this in the Phillips translation. The Phillips translation says, Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And in a very real sense, we let people who hate the church tell us what our role in the world is to be. We let people who hate Christians tell us what we can and can't get involved with. We have people who don't like God tell us what we can talk about. Where did that come from? Why do we let the world squeeze us into its mold? We should be re-squeezing the world into God's mold. That's what we're supposed to be after. So what's happened is the church in recent generations has reshaped itself to all the... You shouldn't be offending people. I mean, as Christians, that's not our duty to offend people. So don't say things from the pulpit that would offend people. Well, then don't preach the Bible because you're going to get people offended every time you preach the Bible. Jesus is proof of that. If you think you're higher than Jesus, not going to offend people? I don't think so. He said, the servant's not higher than the master. If they've done it to me, they're going to do it to you. So that's, that's the way we've got to start thinking. So having said that, I want to go back to this sermon for, for a minute. Let's, uh, let's pretend here we are in Colorado. You check your messages this afternoon. And you got a call from Governor Hickenlooper. And he says, I've got a session of legislature going right now. We're going to have a special session, and I'm going to be there. Lieutenant Governor's there. I'm going to have the House and Senate, everybody there. I want you to preach a sermon to the entire state government of Colorado a week from Monday. If Christians had an opportunity to do that, what would they preach about? Well, my argument is that they would probably preach about salvation, which is good. People need to know about Jesus. 
But that's the difference between making disciples and making converts. We used to go in and say, oh, I've been keeping up with the legislature. Notice you're having trouble with the debt. Let me tell you how to get out of debt. Here's biblical guidance on how to avoid debt. And I see that you're wanting to raise taxes over here, and it's okay to raise taxes, but you cannot do an estate tax. The Bible condemns estate taxes. It condemns capital gains taxes. It condemns progressive taxes. But you can't do a capitation tax. That, that's biblical. I mean, whatever the issue was, immigration or, or military or, or defense or health or whatever, that's what those sermons were for 170 years. They gave practical guidance, which is why everybody wanted to be a Christian, because it's such a practical book. Man, it helps me all. I can get out of debt. I, I, I can make economics work right. I can make health care work right. And, and that's what we did for those years. So again, this is going back to the role of the church in previous years. Now, what happened, we've already talked about what happened with the Great Commission, how we turned that away from a discipleship mandate, but it is discipleship. We used to make disciples of all men, and that's what we did in government as well. Now, having said that, Matthew 22, 28, when the scripture says, you teach them everything I have taught you, let me just do a quick reminder of certain things that Jesus taught about. We talked about one of them this morning uh, in Matthew 19. It's Jesus' teaching on no-fault divorce. He went through and said, and he spent a long teaching on it. We don't talk about that in the church. That's not an issue we talk about. There's a huge difference between fault divorce and no-fault divorce. If we're to teach everything he taught, we have to spend time teaching that because that's one of his teachings. Also, the definition of marriage, really simple. You know, you've got Genesis 1 through 3, Adam and Eve and children, and then over here as they were talking no-fault divorce, the disciples said, Lord, that's a hard teaching. How can anybody stay, I mean, this culture, divorce is common. He said, that's hard teaching. He said, don't you remember that at the beginning he created them male and female? And he said, Whatever God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Yes. Jesus reaffirmed marriage is a lifelong union of a man and a woman. That's what marriage is. So we're supposed to be teaching the definition of marriage as well. We didn't do that. Matter of fact, and the last time we had, the courts have intervened now, but the last time we had elections on marriage was four years ago, and we had, uh, one, we had one state in particular that narrowly lost the marriage uh, amendment uh, defining marriage as a man and woman, and there were four churches in that state, including one that had 30,000 members, evangelical Bible-believing churches, that said, we refuse to talk about marriage in the pulpit. We will not talk about political things from the pulpit. Whoa, that's a Jesus thing. That's not a political thing. You, you, you know, I had a, I had a friend, a uh, Methodist lady, she was a spirit-filled Methodist, and she did something that's always stuck with me. She was in a rural part of Oklahoma in the Panhandle and is a spirit-filled woman, part of a globe. There were a lot of denominations that, oh, Holy Spirit doesn't do that kind of stuff. And she always kept a little $1 New Testament with her in her purse. And they said, oh, Holy Spirit doesn't work like that today. And she would open it up and she would tear out Mark 16 and she would tear out the book of Acts and then she'd tear out Romans 14. And they said, what are you doing? You're tearing stuff out of the Bible. She said, I know, but I'm making a Bible you're gonna like. Once I tear this stuff out, you'll really get along with this one. And it's like, you can't do that to God's word. Well, see, that's where I am on politics. We can't talk about politics. Okay, let me tear out Matthew 19 here, and I'll just go through and tear out. Page. And, and, and you can't do that. Well, you said you didn't want to talk. This is a Bible you're going to like because it has the stuff you want to talk about. See, it's a good visual for what we're excluding that we should not be excluding, if, if, if that all makes sense. So definition of marriage. Here's another one from Jesus. Luke 19, rewarding profit makers. This is where Jesus talks about the capital gains tax because remember he, he told the account of he brought all the servants there before him and in Luke 19 he said he gave each one a mina. Now a mina is translated as a specific amount of money. Today it would convert to about $10,000. So he gave each one about $10,000. He said go invest it. Let me see what you do with that investment. I'll check with you when I get back. Got back. This guy, he said, what'd you do with that investment? He said, nothing. I never liked you. I never thought you were fair. I always thought you were a hard master. I never liked you at all. I did nothing with it. He said, you didn't even put it in the bank to make interest on it? I did nothing. Okay. What'd you do? Well, I turned five-fold profit on it. I, I took, and, and I took that 10000 you gave me. I've now got 50000 to give back to you. Well done, good and faithful servant. What'd you do with it? I got tenfold on it. Uh, you gave me 10000 I'm giving you 100000 back. I made a tenfold profit on it. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then he says, Take that guy who did nothing with it and give it to this guy who had 10. They said, whoa, that's not fair. He's already got 10. And Jesus says, to him who has will more be given. To him who has not will be taken away even that which he has. If you're good at turning a profit, we're going to keep pouring it to you and let you keep turning the profits. If you're not productive, we're going to take it away from you. We're not going to give the non-productive more stuff. What do we do with tax policy today? 
If you're really productive, we'll take it away from you and give to somebody who's not productive. And if you're so incompetent that you run your company into the ground, we'll bail you out. No sweat. We'll take care of that. Exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches, which is why a capital gains tax is not biblical, because you're taking profit makers and you're giving it to the non-productive. Exactly the opposite. Let's teach that, because that's a teaching from Jesus. By the way, when you look at the parables from a practical standpoint, not a spiritual standpoint, there's all sorts of application. And by the way, Matthew uh, 20, Jesus goes into the minimum wage and he goes into employer employee contracts. He talks about the inviability of an agreement reached between an employer and his employee. He talked particularly about the vineyard and how that he agreed with this guy to come to work for a certain amount. The guy worked all day at that amount. He got a guy who needed more workers. He went out later in the day, said, I need some more workers, and he agreed to pay him a certain amount. And so individually, all day long, he's bringing workers in. And at the end of the day, when he starts paying them off, he gave them all the same amount. The guy that worked one hour and the guy that worked 10 hours. And the guy that worked 10 hours says, whoa, that's not fair. I've been here longer. He said, whoa. He said, didn't you agree to work for me at that rate? He says, have I done anything wrong? Because we made that contract, that agreement. He says, if you don't like that, you can go to a vineyard down the road and see if you can get a better rate from them. You, you go compete in the free market and see what you can get. In Matthew 20, 15, he says, is, I'm an employer. He says, it's not my money, mine to do with as I please. Which is why the minimum wage is wrong, because the government is telling employers what to do with their money. You can't do that. Jesus sets up the inviability of the one-on-one -on -one contract between the employer and the employee. I will pay you what I think you're worth, and you'll agree to work for me for whatever that is. If you don't like that, there's other guys you can work with, but nobody's going to tell me what to do with my money. That's Jesus talking about that. Jesus is opposed to minimum wage. Doesn't Jesus understand about the poor? I think so. I think Jesus helped the poor more than anybody else ever did. And look what he did with the minimum wage. And by the way, we're finding now that in those four states that adopt minimum wage this last election, several businesses are already going under because it's driven them out of business. They, they can't do it. Well, what happened to all the jobs? It was supposed to create more jobs, make more money. Now, minimum wage is always entry level stuff. People don't live at minimum wage. They get through that in a hurry. That's just a starting job so you can learn a few skills and get into something that's real. So it, it never works the way that they, that's why you always go back to the Bible for your guidance. Uh, you have here John 8, the right of legal confrontation. Did you know that the 4th through 8th Amendment of the Constitution, what we call the due process clauses, all came out of the Bible? The right to confront your accuser came from what Jesus gave in John 8, 12. Matter of fact, the right to confront your accuser also comes out of Proverbs 18, 17 that says one side always sounds good until you get the other side there to cross-examine them, which is why the Constitution allows you to compel witnesses in your favor. The government comes in and said, here's what he did. Well, that sounds really good until you get the rest of the story. Here's an example. This is a case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court. This case before the U.S. Supreme Court dealt with federal mail carriers. It says you cannot impede the mail. It says it is a federal, uh, is a federal offense that will put you in jail if you impede a mail carrier. Well, as it turns out, there was a guy named Ferris. He and three of his buddies went out and stopped the mail carrier from delivering mail. So the federal prosecutor said, ah, you've impeded the mail, and they brought these four guys into court to prosecute them and throw them in jail. And the four guys admitted, yeah, we impeded the mail. That's it. You're guilty. They said, can we tell the rest of the story? Yeah. I'm a sheriff, and these three guys are my deputies. He's accused of murder. I'm going to arrest him for murder. Oh, that was why you stopped him from delivering mail? Yeah, because we're arresting him for committing murder. Oh, well, that's not what the law applies. So you get the other side. The whole story looks different. That's why the government doesn't get to just present its side. You get to compel witnesses in your favor to tell the rest of the story. That's Proverbs 18, 17. It goes back to what Jesus said. You have a right to confront your accuser, John 8, 12. So all of this are the teachings of Jesus. You get this and teach this, it'll change the culture. That's John Adams going back to what he said. That's why he said the pulpits have thundered. That's why they called them the Black Regiment. These are the guys who are teaching all this stuff that changes cultures and changes the way people think. Now, Going through that, let me jump out of that for a little bit, and let me go a little bit after looking back, because about a century later, this guy, Bishop Charles Galloway, church historian, he looked back at the preachers in the American Revolution, looked back at the role of the church and Christians in the American Revolution. I love the way he described them. He says, mighty men they were, men of iron nerve and strong hand and unblenched cheek and heart of flame. I don't think that's the way the New York Times would describe most preachers today. 
But that's the description we had of preachers back at the beginning. He continued, he says, God needed not read shaken by the wind, nor men clothed in soft raiment, Matthew 11. He needed heroes of hardihood and lofty courage. He needed some folks with backbone. He said, and such were the sons of the mighty who responded to the divine call. Now, there's a lot of evidences and proof of this. Let me take you, for example, to the beginning of the American Revolution, April 18th, 1775. This is when we're waiting to see where the 700 British are going to get off the ship, which way they're going to go. And that's where the, the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow poem comes in about midnight ride of Paul Revere, one if I land, two if I see, and the, you know, the, the lanterns they hung in the belfry of Old South, Old North Church. And so they're waiting to see, and as they get the word and find out where those 700 British troops are going, Paul Revere begins his midnight ride, and he's riding. And by the way, Paul Revere was not the only guy riding. There were a lot of others that rode as well. And one of the guys we never talk about anymore is a guy named Wentworth Cheswell. Wentworth Cheswell was also riding, raising an alarm. Wentworth Cheswell was the first black American ever elected to office in America. He was elected to office in 1768, and for the next 49 years, he was re-elected to office. He held eight different political positions. One of the things we do in America is we are really lousy on teaching black history. And this guy was a strong Christian. He was a church leader. He was one of the, the leaders running his church. And so here, and I love that image of black and white riding saying, hey, everybody wake up, here's the danger. So it was, you know, across the races we were doing this together. Well, Revere is going looking, and Revere is not just riding for, for grins. He's not just riding across the countryside saying, everybody wake up, the British are coming. He's specifically looking for two folks. The two folks he's looking for is he's got to find John Hancock and he has to find Sam Adams. Now, we own 100,000 documents from before 1812, so I own thousands of handwritten documents of these guys and others, all these old sermons. And I actually have the document that the British had, the order they gave those 700 troops. The order the British commander gave those 700 troops was very simple. He said, you bring back to me the bodies of Hancock and Adams. I want those two guys dead at my feet. 700 of you, go find them, get them back. Well, that's right, Revere is looking to find these guys. He's got to find them. Now, Massachusetts on horseback, no technology. How do you find guys? They, they could be anywhere. They do rallies all the time with the Sons of Liberty. Where are they? Everybody knew where they were. They stayed at the home of the Reverend Jonas Clark, and that's exactly where Paul Revere was riding, was the home of the Reverend Jonas Clark. When word got to Hancock and Adams that the 700 British soldiers are coming, they looked at, at Reverend Clark and said, Pastor, are, are your people ready for this? He got indignant and backed up. He said, he said, of course they are. He said, I've trained them for this very hour. So the next morning when the British came to town, there were 70 Americans out there to meet the 74 Americans out to meet the 700 British. They were all the guys out of his church. It was the church bells that rang calling the church together to defend the town from the British. So at the end of that battle, you have 18 Americans laying there on the ground. It was a lopsided battle, 700 versus 74. We didn't get any British. They got 18 Americans. Lying there on the ground together were white patriots like John Robbins and black patriots like John Estabrook. Black and white going to church together, but as the church stepped out to defend the town. Once the British went through Lexington, they went on to the North Bridge at Concord. When they got to the North Bridge at Concord, the Reverend William Emerson had his church out there to defend Concord, had 300 men out there. And the British lost soldiers at that point. No Americans were killed, but the British lost soldiers. And the British are saying, um, this is not going the right direction because we had 70 Americans there and we did okay. We got 300 here and it's not going well. We need to get back and get reinforcements. So they turned around, started marching back to Charleston, 19 mile march on the road. As they went along the road, they found between three and 4,000 Americans lining the road on both sides, shooting at them from both sides. They're running a lead gauntlet to get back. And, and, and where'd all these guys come from? Well, it's really interesting to see. You had the Reverend Payson Williams who took a bunch of guys out of his church to attack the British as they went back to Boston. You also had the Reverend Benjamin Balk who got a bunch of guys out of his church. The, church, the, the, the guys lying on the side of the road were churches and their pastors there to defend because they're being attacked. Really? You know, I, I don't think I've heard that. Then, Six weeks later, we have the Battle of Bunker Hill. And, and by the way, the Battle of Bunker Hill, uh, the hero of Bunker Hill's painter, John Trumbull, founding father who was in the revolution, painted this painting, and he put the hero off to the side so you know exactly who it was. And it's that man right there. That's Peter Salem. Peter Salem was the hero of the Battle of Bunker Hill, standing right beside him is Thomas Scrubner right here. And again, black and white, fighting side by side, you know, going after oppression, whatever was going on. 
And so at the Battle of Bunker Hill, you had all sorts of churches that came out and were there. You had the, the river, well, well, we'll look at some of that later, but word gets across America that Boston's being attacked and Bunker Hill and Lexington and Concord and all this stuff. So across the country, they start getting recruits coming into Boston to stand with their brethren. For example, up in Vermont, the Reverend David Avery took 20 guys out of his church and headed for Boston. Got to, got to get down there and help our brethren. And it's interesting because 20 is not that impressive today, but America back then, all the way from Maine down to Florida, only had 3 million people total. So when you're in a state like Vermont and you got 20 guys in your church, that would have been a mega church back then. That'd be, and given the spiritual condition of Vermont today, it's probably still a mega church today if you got 20 guys in your church in Vermont. But he takes 20 guys out of his church and he heads for Boston. And then you got Reverend Stephen Farrar in New Hampshire who grabbed 97 guys out of his church to go down there and help the brethren. And, and it's just this way, I mean, Reverend Willard, he's on the other side of Boston. He hears about Bunker Hill. He forms two full companies out of his church, marches across town to be there at Bunker Hill. This is the way the American Revolution went. You have John Steele who got 900 guys out of his church. Reverend John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg got 300 guys out of his church. They were the 8th Virginia Regiment. I mean, this is... So many of the regiments in the American Revolution, nothing more than pastor leading their congregation out to defend their rights. And that's the way it went. We don't cover that in history today, but it's really easy to cover back then. So J.T. Headley is another historian in, in, in that period. And he said, you know, in addition to all these preachers being out on the front line, standing between their flock and danger, wherever they, see a hireling turns and runs. It's a shepherd who will stand between danger and the flock. And so it was the preachers who were out there, the hirelings, I'm not getting involved in that kind of stuff. They'll criticize me if I say anything. That's a hireling. You get out there in front of the danger if you're a shepherd. Remember what Jesus says about, about a shepherd and a hireling. So here, J.T. Headley, historian, says the patriotic clergy of the revolution were the soundest statesmen of the time. So in addition to being out where the danger was, they also are the policy makers who helped create policy. Let me show you some examples of this. We take the Declaration of Independence. We take these 56 guys who signed the Declaration of Independence. These 56 guys here, I often ask groups, um, speak at law schools. I was at Duke University Law School. I said, who do you recognize up there? And everybody got Jefferson, everybody got Franklin. These two guys right there. And that's all they could get. And I said, well, you know, who are the others? And I, well, this guy is Richard Henry Lee, and this is George Clinton, and that's Sam Adams, and that's Charles Carroll, and that's Robert Morris, and that's Benjamin Rush. The guy with the hat is Stephen Hopkins. Beside him is William Williams. The guy leaning on his elbow is Elbridge Jerry. Beside him is Robert Treat Payne. I go through the other 54 names. People have never heard those names before. We have been trained to recognize the two least religious founding fathers, and we just told everybody was like them. That's not it by a long shot. Of that group right there, these guys involved in Christian ministry, and 29 of them attended schools that were started to train ministers of the gospel. You've got all sorts of Christian guys up here. This is the Reverend Dr. John Witherspoon right there, did America's First Family Bible. He did the first, this is Thompson Bible. He did the first translation of Sept Greek Septuagint into English. He did the first mass-produced Bible, Benjamin Rush. He started the Sunday School Movement in America. He produced America's first hymn book. He set the 150 Psalms to music so that we could sing the song. I mean, it's, he had Christian ministers all over the place up there. And this is the book they used to write the Declaration. Matter of fact, Richard Henry Lee right, oops, Richard Henry Lee right here on, on, on the edge. Come on. This guy right there, Richard Henry Lee, said that they, quote, copied the Declaration from that book. And that's the book that mentions 1,500 Bible verses. So that's why when you look at the Declaration, it was just the sermons because it was full of all these Bible precepts and concepts. So we had preachers involved. But what the Declaration did was it wiped out 13 state governments because they'd all been British-run, crown-approved governments. And so now having wiped out 13 governments, the Bible very clearly says you are to have civil government. You're not to be without civil government. So they start going back to their states and creating state constitutions. And it's amazing to see in, in all these constitutional conventions of the states, it was so often the preachers who wrote the constitutions for those states. They're the ones who created, the, and to this day, you look at the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, that's still the constitution they have today. They've had it since 1780. It was written by all sorts of preachers back then. They wrote good civil doctrine documents because they based it on biblical principles, and biblical principles are timeless. Those principles work every time they're used. So these are guys involved, but they didn't stop there. Afterwards, we had the Constitution Convention after the revolution's over 11 years later. And you look at the Constitution Convention, it is so loaded up with theologians. Uh, this man right here is Abraham Baldwin. He's the youngest theologian in America. This man right here is a professor of divinity at Yale University. This man is a theologian, William Samuel Johnson. He is from uh, Connecticut, from New York. Right here, leaning over the table is William Livingston. He's a missionary. He was a missionary to the Mohawk Indians when he was 14 years old. Uh, he is from New Jersey. I, I, I just keep going through these guys, which when you look at what they did, it's not surprising to see how our Constitution turned out. 
and you look, and our Constitution is loaded up with Bible verses throughout. There are so many of the phrases that are just direct quotes out of the Bible. And people today say, oh, it's a godless Constitution, it's a secular document. When they tell me that, what they have told me is they are biblically illiterate. They don't recognize Bible verses because they're all through the, the Constitution. That's because a bunch of preachers helped write the Constitution, but we didn't stop there. We had then four years after the Constitution's in place, we had the, the Congress convened. And, and by the way, to get the Constitution in place, we had to ratify it because all they did was the Constitution Convention. Now you've got to get the 13 states to go along with it. So, so they send the Constitution to all the 13 states and you have to have ratifying conventions, conventions for the 13 states. And if you're going to ratify a government document, where do you send it? State capital, right? No. No, if you're in, if you're in uh, states like Massachusetts or North Carolina, the ratification convention for the U.S. Constitution was held inside churches. They met in churches to ratify and discuss the Constitution. And each state had to elect ratifying delegates to ratify the Constitution, discuss it, make sure it had the right principles. And 44 of the ratified delegates were ordained preachers of the gospel. I mean, we were very involved in all this. So not only would we get out front and face danger ourselves, we're very much involved in creating policy that reflects as many biblical principles as we understand and can come up with. And then four years after, after that, we have the Constitution in place and we say, well, we need to protect additional rights, so we have the Bill of Rights. This is the Bill of Rights done in 1791. And it's interesting that the bottom of the Bill of Rights is only two signatures at the bottom. One, you see John Adams, but the other is the Reverend Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. He's a preacher. The first speaker of the House of Representatives who did our Bill of Rights as a preacher of the gospel? Absolutely. He was one of those preachers in those 19 churches in New York City when the British landed. They chased him out of his church and desecrated his church. He stands outside of Washington's church, goes down and says, if I don't get involved, I'm going to lose all my liberties. That's what got him involved in government, was watching his liberties be taken away from him. Yeah. So he ends up being the first speaker of the House. And by the way, in the House, you had all sorts of preachers who helped do that. His brother, Reverend Peter Augustus, Peter, John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, he was also a major general. He was the guy who got 300 guys out of his church, but you also have Abel Foster, Benjamin Conti, Abraham Baldwin, Payne, Wingate. All these guys are preachers, and, and they helped do the First Amendment. So from start to finish all the way through, the bottom line is real simple. You wouldn't have American government today if it hadn't been for the church. It's just, it, that's the way it is. And yet the church today has decided we don't need to be involved in this. Guess what? You won't have American government anymore, not the way we know it. It'll be something totally different, which is why these foreign countries say, hey, can you help us be like what you guys used to be? We don't want to be what you are now, but we want to be what you used to be. See, America is no longer one of the most corruption-free governments in the world. We've now fallen down to, I think, it's 27th in the world in corruption. We're no longer considered one of the most free nations in the world. We've fallen down to about 17th in, in freedom. Well, I mean, in all these categories, we're moving the wrong direction over the last 20 years. We're just going... the. I mean, our, even our prosperity has gone down. I showed you that we have 25% of the nation's GDP. Ten years ago, we were at 32% of the nation's GDP, I mean, of the world's GDP. So we've gone from 32% down to 25% in just a decade economically, moving the wrong direction. Anytime you don't do it by biblical principles, it will not work right. It's just that simple. And so that's what we knew. I'll close with this challenge in the last few minutes we've got here. Charles Finney was a preacher who grew up under... George Washington, John Adams, et cetera. He's one of the greatest revival preachers in our history. Charles Finney is part of the Second Great Awakening. And Charles Finney has an autobiography that's worth reading. And Finney says in his autobiography that he did not want to get in, one of the most influential preachers in American history, he did not want to get in ministry. He wanted to be an attorney. And he said that as he was reading his law books, when he read his law book, he would often give the Bible verse on which the law was based. So in the process of reading his law books, he got saved and became a Christian by studying to be a lawyer. Now see if you can do that in a law school today. See if you can find a law. But that's, laws had biblical foundations and basis, and as he read the laws, he read the basis, and that's how he became a Christian. So he becomes a minister. He sees the example through the American Revolution of pastors being on the forefront. The big issue in his generation starting in the 1820s and 30s was that of slavery and of civil rights. He gets very intimately involved. He said the church cannot stay on the sidelines with it when there's a cultural issue. The culture needs to reflect the Bible. Slavery does not. He had a university. His is the first university in America that had both blacks and whites, men and women as equals at the university. First one to do that because it's real simple Bible teachings that he had. There. And so as, as you go through the years, and he is leading in this, this thing of, of equality and, and, and getting blacks and whites equal and civil rights. And, 
It's interesting that he had a huge following of preachers. I mean, huge. Preachers across the country knew who we were as a nation, knew the church had to be involved. And you'll find that Finney, and, and he's in this, they have a hard time knowing how long the Second Great Awakening went. Sometimes they can't tell if it's the Second Great Awakening or Second and Third Great Awakenings, but here's the deal. It went from 1801 to 1878. So you've got a basically a 77-year revival that went on, and he's the lead guy across that time. You see, he wrote books called Systematic Theology, and he taught that you can do things to create a revival in your nation. The Bible is clear of what it takes to have a revival. If you will do these things, you can bring a revival. You don't have to just sit back and pray that God just hopefully shows up someday. There are things that you can do biblically, and that's what he believed, and that's what they did. And so I want to show you what he told the preachers in his day. Here's what he said. He said, brethren, our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. You look across history, you look at what we've done. We wouldn't be a nation if it wasn't for what we did. He said, our preaching has huge impact. He said, but if immorality prevails in the land, the false hours in a great degree. Wow. You don't blame media. You don't blame schools. You don't blame, you blame the church because the church got out of all of those arenas. Do you know, as late as 1968, Hollywood still went to the church and said, is it okay if we show this film? And the church would say, no, nah, it's not a very good film. Why don't you do it a little different? And that's what we used to do. But in 1968, the church said, why don't you guys do entertainment? We don't need to be involved in that anymore. We'll get a... Oh, how's that gone since 1968? The church decided it didn't want to be salt and light. We can't figure out why Hollywood is so corrupt. I wonder how that happened. If immorality prevails in the land, the false hours in a great degree. He says, if there's a decay of conscience, the pulpit's responsible for it. Wow. He says, if the public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. Wait a minute, what's the pulpit have to do with the press? Real simple. You see, we so taught people a biblical worldview, they wouldn't buy secular garbage. If the press was going to sell a paper, it had to match up with what biblical thinking was, which is why even in the Denver, Denver newspapers, if you look after World War II, in case you missed church on Sunday, you could get the Monday edition of the Denver newspapers and it would review the major sermons that had been preached in the pulpit across the city because we wanted to know what was coming out of the pulpit. So the media will cater to the appetite of the people. We so shape the worldview that if, it gets, if the public press lacks moral discrimination, it's because we haven't shaped people to think right. He says, if the church is a different worldly, the pulpit's responsible for it. He says, if the world loses its interest in religion, the pulpit's responsible for it. That's because we haven't made it practical. Two out of three Americans today, including two out of three who go to church, don't think that church is very practical. And I agree. I go to so many churches, I get a salvation message every Sunday. I don't need to get saved 52 times a year. I need to do something on Monday morning. Give me something to do when I leave church. You know, I, I need something that's practical. So, if the world loses it, if Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit's responsible for it. He says, if our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, he said, the pulpit is responsible for it. He said, now, look at this. He said, let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but let us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation. We're going to stand before guys. I gave you guys America. What would you do with that? Oh, it went really bad. I don't know what those guys did. No, put it in your hands. What would you do with it? Yeah. See, he gave it to us. He said, occupy till I come. All of these areas we've got to be involved with. Look how he finishes. He says, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. He said, politics are part of a religion in a country such as this, and that's occupy till I come. He says, and Christians must do the duty of their country as part of their duty to God. He said, God will bless or curse this nation according to the course that Christians take in politics. Now, this came from one of his revival lectures. You know what lecture this was? It was lecture number 15 called Hindrances to Revival. He said, if you want to hinder revival in nations, stay out of politics. Because what you'll do is you'll create a culture that's hostile to your faith. And so as people come to Christ and want to express their faith, they find that they get stepped on. A kid at school can't say God anymore. We can't have a kid prepare with their lunch. And so instead of being able to express their faith and be welcome, it stomps it down. Because you guys didn't take the right ground in regard. It's really hard to have a revival when you have a culture that is so anti-biblical. And that's because you stayed out of the process. 
So that's why he said if you refuse to get involved, it's a hindrance to revival. If you want revival, you got to get involved. So there are so many ways we can get involved in every aspect of life. What I'm challenging you to do is think outside the box. Do not let Christianity be narrow. Do not let your faith be narrow. It applies to every aspect of life. Get in that word. Find those principles. Apply them. It'll make a difference. God bless you guys. See you tomorrow. Thanks, guys.